Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Katoa. Good morning, everyone. I'm Lavan Savaraja, fourth year medical student and the team leader for this public health project. Our project today is looking at traffic related air pollution, associated health effects, perception, and also communications. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge and thank a few people. Firstly, our supervisors, Professor ha um, Philippa Howden Chapman and Dr. Caroline Shaw, for their support and, and advice throughout the whole project and also to Kerry Hurley and Neville Pierce from the Department of Public Health for, their all, for all their help. I would also like to acknowledge our client from the Greater Wellington Regional Council, Tamsin Mitchell, for her input in the planning of the project, and our key informants from various organizations for all their contribution. I would also like to thank all of you for taking an interest in this topic and coming here, because it is something that we should all be concerned about. Lastly, I would like to thank and congratulate my team, fourth year medical students of University of Otago and Laura Upton from the University of Bristol for all their hard work and dedication to the project. And a special mention to Nikita Unka for the amazing post that she made for us. <laughs> and now to our project, traffic related air pollution. Air pollution has been recognized as an increasing issue internationally and it has major health effects on the population. But you might wonder, why do we care? We are clean, green New Zealand, and us in Wellington. We have the wind, it sorts everything out. But did you know that just five minutes away from here, the corner of Riddiford and Hall Street has one of the highest nitrogen dioxide measurement in the country? And studies have shown even low ambient exposure to air pollution has measurable health effects on the population because air pollution affects everyone therefore it has an enormous population attributable risk. Wellington being ranked third most populated region in the country and our most used mode of transport being private car, we can assume that we contribute a lot of traffic related air pollution. But to top that up, we've just recently expanded our motorway and introduced a smart motorway, making it convenient for people to commute in and out of um, Wellington using private cars. This not only encourages people to use private cars, but also deters people from using public transport. So we need to consider what is Wellington's perception on traffic related air pollution. This brings me to our study and our aims. So we did a literature review looking at the health effects associated with tra traffic related air pollution and a street intercept survey looking at what Wellingtonians views and ideas on the issue. And then followed by key informant interviews looking at um, views and ideas of policymakers in Wellington. We also looked at the communication aspect, looking at how, this, how traffic related air pollution has been communicated in the past in the media and effective strategies for the future. Now I would like to pass on to the literature review group to tell you more about their findings. Good morning. Um, so my name's Nick, this is Kavindu, and this is Catherine, and we were part of the literature review team looking into the health effects of air pollution, um, traffic related air pollution. I'm going to talk generally about traffic related air pollution, and then Kavindu and Catherine are going to talk a bit more detail about the health effects. So the first thing we asked was, what is traffic related air pollution? Because we see a lot of information about smoking and the toxins and adverse effects it has. Unlike smoking, we don't see a lot about traffic air pollution, even though it too produces thousands of pollutants. So here are some examples of the pollutants it produces which are commonly studied. So on the left, PM stands for particulate matter. These are particulates which, when we inhale them, they cause inflammation and adverse health effects. So the number beside them, like PM10, stands for the size of a particle. So PM10 means less than 10 microns in diameter. PM2.5 are smaller, so less than 2.5 microns in diameter. And these can cross the lung membranes and get into the bloodstream. Recent research has also shown that there are even smaller particles which can cross from the bloodstream through the blood-brain barrier. On top of this, there are combustion products, 
such as nitrous oxides, NOx, black carbon, BC, carbon monoxides, and carbon dioxides. Um, and ozone is also formed as a secondary product, um, which is formed with interactions between pollutants and the atmosphere. And it's not just what comes out of the exhaust, but dust from road, tyre and brake wear have also been shown to have effects on our health. Now here's a short overview of the health effects that have come out of the literature. So we found associations between TRAP and mortality, respiratory, cardiovascular, cancer and cognitive function. And these are what Kavindu and Catherine will talk about shortly. Um, so there's both, so air pollution is both short and long-term health effects. However, we know that it's cumulative exposure to air pollution, which has the greatest effect overall. And I think this is a really important point, that um, this cumulative nature means that you can't like, obviously see a connection between, say, death and air pollution. But, um, but because we're exposing the whole population to air, air pollution, and this is over someone's lifetime, that's a lot of people over a long period of time. And that's what makes these cumulative effects add up to significant health effects. Now, how many people are affected? Um, how do we work out how many people are affected by air pollution? Well, we use models to work out for, for a health effect for a given, say, um, level of air pollution, um, how much we can attribute to it. So if we know how much of say with PM10 and deaths, um, if we know how much uh, air pollution traffic contributes, then we can work out how many deaths are attributable to traffic. So in 2012, a report done by the Happens Group using 2006 census data found that in New Zealand there were 256 deaths attributable to trap, with a total social cost of $934 million. But Perhaps more significantly, this was this included 353,000 restricted activity days, which are days in which people couldn't do what they would have done otherwise if there wasn't air pollution. Now, in Wellington, we have less good quality data. So for the whole of Wellington City, we only have one air quality monitoring station, and that's that one on the left um, on Willis Street. Now it does show that overall Wellington has good air and within national and World Health Organization guidelines. But as Levan mentioned at the start, the NZTA actually has some smaller monitoring stations around Wellington and, and they have shown that that corner of Redford and Hall Street is one of the most polluted corners in the country. Uh, in the literature, there's also evidence of significant inequalities in air pollution. So um, we've seen in overseas studies that disadvantaged groups, these groups with lower socioeconomic status or certain ethnicities, can have greater exposure to air pollution. This has also been shown in a study locally in a study from Christchurch, uh, which showed that gr groups with greater deprivation got a greater exposure to air pollution. And this might be for reasons such as lower cost housing tending to be closer to main busy roads. On top of this, these groups also tend to have more comorbidities, such as asthma, which means that air pollution has an even greater effect on their health. So a study of, another study out of Christchurch found that Māori are more susceptible to mortality from air pollution than non-Māori. So I'll now pass you on to Kavindu, who's going to talk a bit more about the health effects of air pollution. Awesome. Thanks, Nick. So I'll be talking about the traffic-related air pollution effects on mortality and respiratory health. So several studies have found that exposure to traffic-related air pollution leads to a significant increase in all-cause mortality. The WHO found that exposure to NO2, PM2.5 and ozone are all associated um, statistically significantly with an increased risk of mortality. And these estimated estimates varied from about 1% to 6%. And although these values may seem tiny, because like so many people are exposed to air pollution, these numbers add up to a significant amount. 
a New Zealand study that actually uh, wasn't specifically looking at traffic-related air pollution found that for every 10 micrograms per cubic, cubic meter increase in PM10, there was a 7% increase in all cause mortality in, men, in people aged in adults compared to a 20% increase in, Ma in the Maori population. And this highlights the, the inequalities that, it, that do exist as a result of this. Um, in terms of the respiratory effects, a, a well-established fact, and it has a large body of evidence, is the association between asthma exacerbation and COPD exacerbations. A comprehensive report which reviewed 20 studies concluded that there was sufficient evidence to say that traffic-related air pollution was um, le led to an increase in exacerbations of asthma. There's also considerable support from existing literature, and it's a continually growing evidence base that suggests that there is an association between new onset asthma in children and traffic-related air pollution. Studies have found that black carbon, NO2, and PM2.5 have all been statistically significant associations with new onset asthma in children. And this is up to the age of around 12 years. And the odds ratio showed like around a 20% increase, which again is quite significant. Um, a report also found that living close to a busy road was independently associated with an increased risk of the incidence of childhood asthma. In terms of lung cancer, there is a lot of evidence link, which links lung cancer and traffic-related air pollution. Studies have found that for every 10 microgram per cubic meter increase in PM2.5 and NO2, there was around a 4% increase in the incidence of lung cancer. Again, this might seem like a small number, but because so many people are exposed, it does have significant effects. There's so much evidence, in fact, that in 2013, the International Agents for for the research on cancer, which is part of a specialized agency of the WHO, announced that outdoor air pollution and PM2.5 were, P, uh, were group one um, carcinogens. And this is the highest degree of evidence for carcinogenicity to humans. And I think referring to the cartoon um, there, the WHO were quoted as saying, Increased risk of lung cancer was observed even in those areas where PM2.5 concentrations are less than the current health-based guidelines. So even though New Zealand's probably not uh, keeping in within the WHO guidelines, I think it is an important health effect that we, and we shouldn't just ignore just because we are you know, under the guidelines. And there is also a lot of evidence that shows that respiratory tract infections in young children are exacerbated by traffic-related air pollution. Now I'd like to pass on to Catherine, who will talk about the cardiovascular, cognitive, and other health effects related to traffic-related air pollution. Thanks, Kev. All right, so now I'm gonna be talking about the effects of trap exposure on cardiovascular effects. Um, as we talked about before, so trap exposure has um, an association with all-cause mortality, and it also has an association with cardiovascular-specific mortality as well. So the most consistent effects of this is with particulate matter 2.5. And there's been some concern in the literature that it may be confounded by noise because they've actually found evidence that traffic noise itself actually can lead to things like hypertension and ischemic heart disease. So you can see how they think that this might confound the relationship. But they've actually found that there's been reviews done and they've found that, that noise and trap actually have quite distinct effects on um, cardiovascular mortality. So this is sort of put to rest. Um, and there's also been some work done on heart failure mortality as well. And so um, increased trap exposure, if you're put in that higher band, then you have a higher um, heart, heart failure mortality rate. Okay, so this is some of the um, cardiovascular outcomes related to trap exposure that have been looked at in the literature. So just to orient you on the graph a little bit, um, just the inside, that's just the gaseous molecules, obviously, and on the outside is the particulate matter 2.5 and particulate matter 10. Um, so ischemic heart disease, so um, they found that um, being, if you are defined in a high trap exposure band, then you have an increased risk for ischemic heart disease, and that's especially linked with um, PM10 and nitrogen dioxide exposure. And the hazard ratios have been quoted between 1.5 and 2, so that's almost double your chance if you are classed within that high exposure band. So that's pretty significant. Um, some of the results have been only applicable to women, but others haven't found any difference. So there's some inconsistencies in the literature there. 
Um, atherosclerosis, there's been lots of work done on here. So this has included um, controlled exposure studies, where, um, which you could argue is gold standard research in this area, where um, volunteers with a history of previous previous MI have been exposed to diesel exhaust for just one hour and after just one hour of exposure they found that there's been increased cardiac burden um, and there's also been quite a bit of animal model research done on mice when they found that they've had increased atherosclerotic plaque development through oxidative stress after diesel exhaust exposure as well um, and heart failure so talked a bit about that before so increased risk of being hospitalized by heart failure if you're classed within that high exposure band um, also there's evidence around venous thromboembolism and arrhythmia as well but this research area is slightly more contentious cool so another area of research is with trap exposure and childhood cancers so um, unfortunately in the reviews that we looked at there was limited amount of studies so that they only could study the outcomes of childhood leukemia and other childhood cancer outcomes couldn't be studied but they did in fact find that there was a um, there was an association between postnatal trap exposure and childhood leukemia but not prenatal trap exposure and childhood leukemia so there's obviously a lot of different types of leukemia so what they did is they just grouped them all together and the results of the meta-analysis just represented an average association between trap exposure and all of those types of childhood leukemia. Um, there's been a lot of cognitive effects related to trap exposure studies. So this has ranged from um, neurodevelopment in the young and through to cognitive decline in the elderly. Um, in, the, in children, so this has been seen through various cognitive tests of intelligence and memory and neurodevelopmental delay. Um, and they've found that this effect is more pronounced in boys rather than girls. Um, cognitive decline in the elderly as well. So um, increased development of dementia and faster cognitive decline as well has been shown with a higher trap exposure. Um, and this has been seen through, again, various cognitive tests of um, memory and orientation. And um, for example, they found that there was poor mini mental state examination scores for every one point index increase in exposure to air pollution. All right. So you know, we've done a summary of all the health effects, mortality, respiratory, cardiovascular, cancer, and cognitive. There's obviously a vast amount of health effects that trap exposure has been shown to have in the literature. Um, there are some inconsistencies, but uh, I think that, you know, there's pretty convincing evidence that trap exposure does have um, the potential to have pretty detrimental effects on your health. And the thing to um, especially remember is that you know, it's not like smoking or some other specific exposure where it only affects a certain group. Traffic-related air pollution affects everybody. So even though the hazard ratios and rate ratios might not be huge, it affects everybody, the whole population. So pretty significant. Thank you. And now we're going to be doing a trap particle revision. Uh, Pokemon Go. What a time to be alive. <laughs> <laughs> so... Kia ora, um, my name's Nikita and this is Fabian and we'll be talking about some of the public perceptions and a survey study. Um, so looking into the literature about what the public thinks about air pollution, um, generally traffic is identified as a major contributor to air pollution and exposure to air pollution is generally perceived to be bad for your health. Um, so reading through reviews and studies, there were three main areas or ideas that came out and seemed to be either potential drivers or obstacles of change. And these were uncertainty, perceived risk and behaviours. Um, so the first one, uncertainty, was an obstacle to change. Um, and things that contributed to uncertainty were people not thinking enough information is actually available on air pollution. Um, and that's both public and scientific knowledge. Um, many people didn't think air pollution was an independent risk factor for negative health outcomes. And also many people felt uncertainty that they were able to make any difference through any action of their own. Um, the next point is perceived risk, which was identified as one of the biggest drivers for change. Um, so some things which influenced risk perception were being able to sense pollution, so seeing or smelling fumes or seeing traffic, traffic congestion um, on the roads. 
Um, another thing influencing risk perception was experiencing negative health effects of air pollution. So, for example, people with asthma tended to think it was more of a problem. Um, and another thing was that well-educated people who perhaps had more access to information or were more health conscious tended to be more concerned about air pollution. Um, and lastly, um, behavioural obstacles. So these were things that both limited understanding and action towards tackling air pollution. Um, so the first point was uh, reluctance to straying from sort of lifestyle norms or social norms. Um, so for example, using a car was often perceived as just more convenient than waiting for any public transport. Um, there was this interesting idea that, especially in suburban re residents, that air pollution happens, but it doesn't happen where I live. Um, and some of the behavioural things that come out of that are either that there's some kind of, like they're blinded by a degree of pride or connectedness to their home, or there's just some denial that you could personally be contributing to the problem of air pollution. Um, and the last point, which is partly behavioural, was that many people didn't really try to access information at all, um, reasons being that they didn't have time, they didn't understand the information that was out there, or they just weren't interested. Um, and I think the flip side to that was a potential lack in communication, which will be addressed later in the presentation. Um, so these are just a few things to keep in mind as we move through the presentation in our findings, and I'll hand over to Fabian to talk about our survey. Thanks, Nikita. Um, so um, I'm Fabian, and along with uh, Lily and Levan and Holly, who's sick and can't be here today, um, we uh, did some surveys on the public. So our survey had 13 questions and included demographic information. And um, we dictated the questions to the participants so that we knew everyone was hearing the same thing. Um, we chose nine spots around Wellington CBD and posted two people at each spot. And we did that in the week and also in the weekend. And so we approached any part uh, potential participants and um, gave our little spiel. And we uh, defined non-participation as making sure that they heard who we are and what we were doing and knew the time limit before we counted them as non-participants. And our target was 300 to 400 people. And um, we surpassed our target with just under 500 people. And our participation rate was uh, 74%, which is pretty good. And so did our sample um, represent Wellington accurately? Um, so this is some demographic information, um, age and gender. So you can see we oversampled um, the age group 20 to 29 and <laughs> undersampled the older age categories, particularly females. Um, in terms of the ethnicity, we did it um, better. So NZ European, Maori, and Asian populations were well represented, but Pacific Island peoples were not. And that, so that data was from the 2013 census. And in terms of results, um, we asked the uh, participants um, how important they thought it was that the government or council did something to address traffic-related air pollution, and we asked them to rank that on a scale of one to five. And so the most common choice was four across the board, the majority being um, three to five. Uh, the mean was 3.6. We then split that data um, into two groups. Those who stated that they were personally affected by traffic-related air pollution, or if their families were personally affected, and those who were not personally affected. And you can see that those who were personally affected thought more strongly with a peak at um, the most common choice of five, but those who were not personally affected had a common choice of four. We also split the data between um, those who used active or public transport, and active transport is walking or cycling or skateboarding or something like that, and um, public transport, and lump them together. And then also if you used a personal motor vehicle, so like a car or a motorcycle. And um, the most common choice for personal motor was three, and the most common choice for active or public was four. So this suggests that those who don't use personal motor vehicles are more concerned about traffic-related air pollution. Um, we also asked them to consider different factors when they were buying or renting a property and included air pollution on there. So air pollution was the least um, important factor out of the ones that we chose, though it was still quite high with a rating of 3.4 out of 5. 
We also split the data between oh, different questions, sorry. Um, we asked how much of a concern air pollution from traffic in Wellington was to them. And we split that between non-Maori and Maori because we know that Maori people are far more affected by air pollution or disproportionately affected. And we found that they weren't more concerned, which is an issue because you know they are more affected. And I'm going to pass on to David and the key informant interviews. Hi, um, so my name is David, and this is our key informant team, Albie, Hope, Frankie, and Laura, who's up here. Um, yeah, so our team conducted 10 interviews with key informants from a diverse range of backgrounds. Um, we interviewed public health researchers to those working in NIWA, Regional Public Health, Wellington City Council, Greater Wellington Regional Council, Ministry of Transport, and NZTA, just to name them all. Um, the key informants were experts who were involved in working with TRAP and their specific agency. I would like to thank them once again for taking part in our project. The interviews lasted 30 to 60 minutes long, were fully transcribed and analysed to identify reoccurring themes. The themes identified were lack of knowledge on quantifiable health harm, which I will talk about, public perception, which Albi will address, lack of political will and communication slash resource allocation, which Hope will talk about, and last of all, transport issues, which Frankie will talk about. Cool. Um, so to the first point, first thing, um, lack of knowledge on quantifiable health harm associated with TRAP. Um, although it has been well established through research that traffic-related air pollution has health harms, the key informants were united in their view that more research needs to be done on quantifying the health effects. By quantifying, I mean giving real numerical numbers as to the disability or death traffic-related air pollution is responsible for and being able to specify the cases of these deaths. This, however, is difficult. And to give you an example, if we look at, say, cancer, people come to the hospital with cancer. Um, it is tangible, quantifiable, easily identified and labelled. This, however, is difficult for traffic-related air pollution, and um, the difficulty arises because traffic-related air pollution is not a disease in itself. However, um, shows its form to other diseases like cardiovascular disease, lung cancer, and asthma exacerbations. One key informant put it this way, people don't turn up at the hospital with air pollution disease. In regards to information that is currently available, one of the key informants referred to the HAPPEN study. He elaborated, however, that the HAPPEN study is an health impact analysis, a prediction of health harm based on a model that has, met, that has made, made many assumptions. The finding of the HAPPEN study were from identifying cases of death caused by air pollution. However, again, through the use of a model that predicts the health harm based on the level of air pollution in a consensus unit. The study has limitations using the unit of premature mortality to make predictions on health harms. This is because one, um, premature mortality is a difficult measure to understand, and number two, because as one key informant put it, it makes the assumption that those living in a census area unit with high levels of air pollution, their death will more likely to be linked with higher level of air pollution than anything else. The current gap in knowledge to determine the actual health harm from traffic related air pollution means that it is difficult to communicate its significance, not only just to the public, but decision makers who want concrete information when planning infrastructure. Now I hand you over to Albie. Cool, thanks for that David. <clears throat> um, so when we were sort of collating all the interviews and um, analyzing the themes that um, were more prevalent. Um, <clears throat> one of the issues that was emphasized were, was the public's perceptions and the fact that perceptions and pressures are often a key driver for, for policy change at both a government and local level. Um, so the first point they're looking at, the lack of visible evidence. Um, so a lot of the key informants touched on the fact that in Wellington you can't really see evidence of the air pollution. I mean, other than maybe a diesel bus in front of you like splurting out some fumes at you as you're riding your bike, um, you don't really get to see it. 
Um, so Wellingtonians are almost a bit of a doubting Thomas in that respect. Um, and that quote there sort of sums it up. Um, if you can't see it, it's not there. Um, now, I don't know if any of you have heard this, but apparently Wellington's quite a windy city. Um, I think we're all a bit sick of hearing that, to be honest, because that isn't an excuse um, that for saying that air pollution isn't an issue. Um, and while the wind maybe gets rid of that smog, so it's not as apparent that um, the pollution is there, it doesn't get rid of it at the source um, where it is still affecting people's health. Um, so this can all sort of, um, as a package, create um, a feeling of ignorance and complacency. Um, that quote there saying that people are probably oblivious to it, I think is fairly true um, in terms of most um, most people. I mean, if you don't know what you don't know, then um, you're not going to be aware and you're not going to make um, any decisions in your own life to try and reduce um, your effect on pollution. Um, then looking at the lack of health evidence, I mean, you've heard a lot about this already, but the key informants also... Um, drew on this the fact that it is quite insidious in its effects, um, air pollution. It doesn't present acutely like, um, say, road, the road traffic incidents where someone is injured or, or dies um, acutely. So um, this quote here from someone at the um, Greater Wellington Regional Council sort of sums that up, um, that people do need to see the consequences of something before they're willing to take action. Um, and we're just waiting for someone to die, which may be true in some instances, but I think the fact of the matter is that people are actually dying from air pollution, and that's what those who did the literature review found, is that there are considerable health effects, um, and that while it isn't acute, we do need to take it seriously. Um, in terms of accessibility and readiness of information, um, I think it can be said that there is, we are lacking on data available to the public, and in terms of the accessibility, that's something that the communication team will touch on um, later. Um, so when you sort of take all this into account, it's pretty clear to see why it isn't a major issue for a lot of the public. I mean, the health effects are insidious. They can't really see it happening. It's not affecting them in their day-to-day -day life. Um, but I think that if we can take the fact of education being a really important tool to empower people, um, and that through educating people about the effects of traffic-related air pollution on their health and the environment, etc., it can really drive policy makers to make, um, to make changes in that area. Um, so I think, yeah, we need to um, educate people so that they're more aware and to create this public pressure. And that was a theme that was shared by all of the um, key informants that we spoke to. Um, so I'll now pass it on to uh, Hope, who's going to talk about um, communication and a lack of political will. Thanks, Albie. So, um a number of our key informant had um, suggested that there was a lack of political will to um, address the issue of air pollution. So following on um, to what Albie mentioned, um, one of our key informant had mentioned that um, it's not an issue that Wellingtonians feel particularly strong about, and therefore it's not going to be an issue that politicians put front and centre. Um, in addition, um, the issue of air pollution might be something that politicians will be unwilling to address because on one of our, as one of our key informant put it, um, it, it could be a politically sensitive issue. So um, politicians require votes from the public and um, yet all of our approaches for addressing um, uh, the issue of air pollution, for example, um, encouraging people to use public transport and less private, uh, private vehicles, um, that might include doing something like, um, for example, increasing the price of parking or taking away parking space. And that's not something the public likes. And therefore, you can see why politicians might be, you know, not so, um, not so motivated to make changes for that issue. Um, and also, while air pollution is an important issue, there are also many other important issues that need to be addressed by the politicians. Um, they, those may be something that the public cares more about um, and perhaps are less reluctant to make changes for. Um, the other issue that was mentioned by um, many of our key informant was communication and resource allocation. 
uh, Manny had had, mentioned, had um, suggested that there was a lack of communication between all of the um, organisations responsible for addressing the issue. And it's not just between technical experts, it's also between uh, experts and politicians. So one of our key informants put it, um, the politicians were confronted with technical uh, report that perhaps are more contestable than it looks. Um, and on top of the communication problem is the fact that all the organisations involved in um, air quality management has their own priorities and they may be conflicting um, and it's a problem because we only have a limited amount of resource that's available to address the issue. Um, and also from another one of our key informant um, had suggested there isn't anyone pulling it together and providing a strategic overview. Um, so put a little picture there to sort of address that. Um, so we don't really have a person or a particular organization that's like the red person in the, in the picture to pull everyone forward. And that's going to affect the coordination between um, all of the institutions responsible. So now I'll pass it on to Frankie, who will talk about transport. <coughs> Thanks, Harp. Um, so the final theme that came out of the key informant interviews was transport. Ooh, there we go. Um, and so that was the current transport situation in Wellington and also some potential future improvements. And the overall message that we got out of those interviews was that the key to addressing transport-related air pollution is getting people out of their private motor vehicles. Now, Wellington already does have one of the best rates for using alternative methods of transport out of anywhere in the country. So that's walking, cycling, public transport, that kind of thing. So that's great, but there's always room to improve. So to do this, we would need input from both council and governmental levels to create a more supportive environment. We need to give people more public transport options. And as you can see, one of our key informants did say that it's only going to get better if we do have more public transport options available. Um, and those options need to be better as well. So that's where the Euro standards and the electric buses come in. So for those who don't know, the Euro standards are an international set of standards which regulate the amount of emissions that are acceptable out of diesel engines. And at the moment in New Zealand, NZTA is endorsing the Euro 5 standards which are fine, but if we went for the Euro 6 standards, that means the emissions profile of all of our bus fleet would drop significantly. So this would mean that any buses that were brought into New Zealand would have to meet the Euro 6 standards. So that would, would have to be balanced against cost, but that would be one way of improving significantly. Um, and we were also told that the eventual goal of the council is to have our entire bus fleet electric. And obviously that is dependent on the technology getting there. Um, as well as those, I haven't put a point up about it, but I'm sure we all know it would be awesome if our city was more pedestrian and cycle friendly. Um, this would not only reduce emissions, but also give us all of the health benefits that come with increased phys physical activity. <laughs> and I'll just end on a wee quote from one of our informants who has given up their car and no longer owns a car and is an enthusiastic supporter of one of the car share schemes in Wellington. If you haven't heard of any car share schemes, go and look it up. It's a really awesome idea. And this person commented that you think you have freedom when you own a car. You don't know freedom until you don't own a car. So that wraps up the key informant section of this presentation. I'm now going to shift gear slightly and look at one of the other concepts which came out of our literature review. All right. So this is our beautiful city of Wellington, a city we're quite proud of. But we do have a problem with air pollution here, and we're not alone with that problem. The urban model that we're currently running on is broken. It's costing us money, it's costing us in terms of our health, and most of all, it's costing us in terms of the environment. Our cities are struggling under the weight of their own population. This is not surprising, given that the model we're currently running on is very outdated and came about during the Industrial Revolution when only 2% of the world's population lived in cities. Cities at the moment are estimated to consume 80% of all the global materials and energy supplies, and we produce 70% of all carbon emissions. Now that's, that's massive. 
And it's also estimated that by 2050, 70% of the world's population are going to live in cities. So this problem is only going to get worse. So this is why there's now been an international movement towards a new model of cities, and that is called sustainable cities. Uh, um, so the goal of sustainable cities is to reduce the impact of those cities on the environment. To achieve this, it would require a massive overhaul of our thinking, our policies and our priorities, but it would result in our cities being far more livable and not resulting in premature death, death from things like trap. One of the crucial factors of sustainable cities is that they're ready for growth. This is really important somewhere like Wellington where urban intensification is inevitable. One example of this that is being currently considered is the urban intensification of Adelaide Road just nearby. Um, so this is an issue that is going to affect Wellington. And another one of the key factors in sustainable city planning is how environmentally friendly and healthy they are. And this is where reducing traffic related air pollution comes in. So how do we get there? We can start by looking at our international neighbours who have started on some strategies. So one of those is low emission zones, which is an area of the city. And to get into that area of the city, you, your vehicle has to meet certain restrictions. So heavy duty vehicles such as buses and trucks that have too high emissions are not allowed entry. Um, and this is currently being used in London and it is being very successful, which is great because London really needs it. It's currently one of the worst air pollution cities in the whole world. Um, but that seems to be working for them at the moment. Another one of the strategies that we could use is congestion charging. So this comes into action during peak traffic hours and you're charged a fee for taking your car into the zone, generally the centre of town, the CBD. You're charged to take your car into them, into there at that point. So that provides a financial deterrent to taking your car in, basically. And this is currently being used in Stockholm, and it's been really successful. They trialled it in 2006, I believe, and then implemented it fully the next year. Um, it's been really successful. And as well as those policies, to really achieve lower traffic volumes and lower emissions, you would need increased availability and increased affordability of good public transport. So those are three ways of addressing the problem. Another option is land use planning. So we can do health impact assessments before any urban residential development goes on, and this can influence where we site the buildings. So simply by increasing the distance between the buildings and major roads can decrease our trap exposure significantly. So for example, by moving back 100 to 150 metres from a major road decreases trap exposure to background levels, which is a significant reduction. Um, so this would be really useful when it comes to separating traffic from sensitive locations like homes, schools, hospitals, rest homes, those kind of things. So there's, that's just a selection of some strategies that we found in the literature, literature review. And so overall, if we aim to reduce the impact of our city on the environment, Wellington can become city of the future and can lead New Zealand into really thinking sustainably. Thank you. I'm now going to pass over to Lily, who's going to have, give us a wee focus break. Great, thank you for that, Key Informants and Literature Review team. Um, so yes, my name is Lily, and I was part of the survey team for this project. Um, and because it's time for a bit of a focus break, I know you're all here because you're um, very concerned, as we are, about pollution. So I thought I might introduce you to a team of people who are trying to do something about it. Earth. Wind, water, heart, go planet! By your powers combined, I am Captain Planet! Captain Planet, he's a hero, gonna take pollution down. Right, I'll stop it there just for the sake of time, but I know you're all dying to hear the rest of the song, so you know you could find it if you like. Um, can I just quickly get a show of hands of anyone who's heard of Captain Planet before? 
Okay, everybody's heard of him. Awesome. Um, so he doesn't really need any more of an introduction than that. He is um, leading a team of planeteers who are fighting to save the planet from pollution. So we're just going to take a few minutes and go through one of their adventures together. <laughs> What's going on, Gaia? Planeteers, this is Darwinia, Australia, and the problem is smog, but it shouldn't be. Look at this. Utterly oh, disgusting. Oh. They have one of the best mass transit systems around. Everybody's within six blocks of the train, and yet hardly anyone uses it. The smog from the cars is so thick, even I can't see through it. Planeteers, you've got to find out why no one is riding that train. Right. So, forgive them. Um, it is an American show. But why do you think no one is using the trains in Darwinia? Can I have a few suggestions? Oh, good suggestion there, Caitlin. Yep. Not reliable? Mm-hmm. That's another really good suggestion. So we've got cost, reliability, anything else? Yep. Full of crocodiles. You know, given that this is a Captain Planet episode, that's not actually such a bad suggestion. Um, all right, should we, um, should we have a look? And now where were we? Ah, yes, my freeway. <laughs> there it is, independence. Freedom from the slavish timetable of public transportation. Isn't it beautiful? It is hideous. Look what is happening to the air. People cannot breathe. Mr. Plunder, we need you. Must I do everything myself? Right. So that was, you just heard from Mr. Plunder. Um, he is the evil villain um, who is trying to pollute the world for his own um, personal gain. And you can see that the planeteers are really quite unimpressed. Um, so, uh, and, and as you saw, he's basically communicated the benefits to the population about using their cars, you know, the independence and the freedom. Um, and so he's also removed the trains from the tracks and dumped them on the bottom of the ocean. So your crocodile idea wasn't, you know, that far off. Um, <laughs> all right, so uh, let's have a look at what this is actually doing to Damania. Planeteer alert! Look at that! All these cars. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Um, so, increased car usage, reduced public transport, obviously, is really devastating the quality of Darwinia's air. Um, in our study, we found that 30% of people use public transport, to, um, usually, to get to the CBD. Um, however, 26% of people, which is almost the same proportion, still use their car. Um, so, again, we, we could be heading in this direction. Um, so, quick question again. What do you think Captain Planet and the Planeteers did about this issue to solve the problem? Any suggestions? They got the what? They got the crocodiles in. Yep. Fair suggestion. Any other ideas what they could have done? What about from my group? <laughs> Replace Mr. Plunder. Yeah, that's another good, another good idea. Um, I was sort of more going for maybe issues that we've focused on in our presentation, maybe like sustainable cities and land planning, maybe or increasing public transport. But we'll, we'll have a look, shall we? put things back on track around here. What a hero. Um, as you can tell, we really love our puns uh, in this group. Um, so yes, yeah, so he has increased the availability of public transport um, and therefore improved the, um, the quality of the air because more people are now going to use public transport. 
Um, so now I'm just going to leave you uh, with a final message from the team to really drive the point home. <laughs> Go bumper to bumper traffic is no picnic for anyone. <laughs> and no one likes to breathe the pollution produced by too many cars. <laughs> but there are things we can all do to help the environment. We can carpool. And combine several errands into one trip. Everyone has to do their part if we want clean air. Right, team? Yay! Remember, the power is yours. <laughs> so I'm now going to hand over to the communications team. Thanks for that, Lily. Um, so um, we're the uh, communications team, and uh, me along. Oh, my name's Tommy, and me along with Ali, Jordan, and Hamid, also known as Professor Smoke. Um, do the communication strand of the project. Uh, so we, the, we, for that we did three different things. We first analyzed all the communication survey questions. Uh, we then did a media, media analysis of all the um, uh, air quality information available to Wellingtonians. And then finally we did a uh, literature review to see uh, which, which is the best way to communicate health information to uh, Wellingtonians. So to start us off we'll have Jordan who's gonna tell us what he found in the survey. Awesome. Thanks, Tommy. Um, yep, so as Tommy said, I'll just quickly take you through the results of the survey questions um, pertaining to communication. So firstly, we asked surveyors um, whether they thought um, more information about traffic-related air pollution would be useful. And as you can see from the graph, the clear majority of people, 74%, thought it would be useful. And similarly, uh, we asked surveyors whether they thought uh, whether they wanted more information about traffic-related air pollution, and again, majority of 84%. So from these two graphs, we can see that um, more information about traffic-related air pollution would be found useful and is wanted by the public. Um, in terms of the types of information wanted, um, the, most, the two most wanted types of information were health effects and environmental effects. Um, so yeah, we just recommend the inclusion of these two kind of aspects of TRAP in any information presented to the public. Um, in terms of communication and the media types, we asked surveyors just to tick from the following selection, which they thought would be most effective in communicating TRAP information. And as you can see, the top two were internet website and social media. Um, we also stratified these data by ethnicity and um, for Māori, who, as we heard from the literature review team, are disproportionately affected by TRAP. Um, the most effective communication type was a social media. So, uh, you know, having targeted initiatives through the use of social media could help with achieving equitable outcomes. Um, and now I'll just pass you back to Tommy for the media analysis. Thanks, Jordan. Um, so for our media analysis, um, what we wanted to do was um, see what kind of air pollution information Wellingtonians had access to um, and what kind of way this information was framed. So we went back to the beginning of 2015 and, um, and we tried to find every, all the kinds of um, information that Wellingtons could find. So we did this uh, through internet searches and um, particular website searches mainly. And we also called and emailed any uh, major stakeholders who we think might have made any physical publications. Um, and for this information that had to include air pollution information about Wellington um, or it had to be from a Wellington source about air pollution. Uh, so this is what we found. We found only 28 different uh, mediums since the beginning of 2015. Uh, the majority of these were kind of news articles with um, the eight print news articles, also the social media pages, the radio articles and the TV news article. Um, so these were only kind of just one-off wee snippets that the public was getting about air pollution. And um, these were mainly about the transition to electric buses, um, in Wellington, um, comparing Wellington air pollution data with other cities in New Zealand and around the world. Um, and also, um, which is uh, something that's quite good, they were um, commenting on new, um, new data that's been published on the health effects of air pollution. Um, we also had seven websites. There were three very good websites. We had the Land Air, um, Land Air Water Aotearoa website, 
the Ministry of Environment website and also the Greater Wellington Regional Council website, which all had very comp comprehensive um, overviews of um, air pollution data as well as transport um, related air pollution, which was very good. Um, and then we, we had some, website, some websites and some smartphone applications, which basically just reported air pollution data. And then um, we got the physical billboard, which is the Willis Street Air Quality Measuring Station. And um, we assumed that the other stations in the greater Wellington region would also have um, similar, similar information on the side of them. So we had a look at these and we, and we had a bit of a subjective view on whether the article, whether the viewer came away, whether the viewer came away was thinking that air pollution is a problem or not a problem. So the majority said that air pollution is a problem, which is very good. But 12 said air pollution wasn't a problem and they did this um, through a few different ways. So one of the ways was they compared Wellington to other cities um, like Timaru and Beijing, which um, we don't think is a very um, good way of, of, of kind of, of saying that, that, that Wellington isn't, um, doesn't have a problem because these cities are much worse off. Um, they also blamed wind for some of them, saying that the only times that we've had um, bad air pollution data points is when the weather has been poor, when we get things such as inversion layers. And um, uh, the same thing there again, you know, I don't think we should really be blaming um, any negative outcomes on, on weather events. But things like the smartphone applications and the websites which reported the data is they, were also, they weren't focused on Wellington, they focused global, globally on uh, air pollution. So any Wellingtonian that accessed the information saw that um, Wellington had low, um, low air pollution, really high air quality, and it was always in green. And it, kind of, and it gave, really gave the impression that air pollution was nothing to worry about. <clears throat> so here in blue on the graph, we have what the survey respondents said they wanted in their uh, air pollution, transport related air pollution information. And in red is what the um, uh, mediums we found actually contain. So the majority of them had um, air pollution um, amounts in them, which is very good. Because as you can see, there's quite a deficit in the environmental effects and ways that they can actually reduce their own um, air pollution. So that's something that we can address when we, if, um, we want to um, make a proper campaign for communicating this kind of data to the, to the public. So now I'll pass on to Ali, who's going to talk about the literature review that we did. All right. So there was 18 of us who spent five weeks, with countless hours and sleepless nights completing this project. <laughs> this also happens with a lot of health professionals doing research, but knowing how to best disseminate the information is often lacking. It can be overwhelming to decide where to, where to um, distribute the information. And there are so many marketing options, as you can say, um, but knowing the, way, the best way to do it is difficult particularly with a limited budget. So we looked at some of the literature to determine the pros and cons about tra from traditional and newer media streams to best guide us on how to best disseminate air quality information. So the traditional means such as TV, radio, and magazine or print are effective ways in providing one-way communication stream to the masses. There is a lot of followers, particularly with te television, being 3.5 million New Zealanders watching television. Um, this is almost 90%. Because these media streams um, have been around for a long time, people often perceive them to be trustworthy, engaging, and entertaining. So this can be a good way to disseminate and raise awareness about health-related information, in particular about pollution. And as we saw from our surveys, there is a serious lack of knowledge about any issue, particularly in Wellington, around air pollution. So looking at um, how often these media streams are used, we can see that people don't read an awful lot, particularly in the younger populations. We do see an increase um, as the population increases in age. However, most of the time people are reading, they are simultaneously doing other things. So does our message really get to them? Probably not. They're probably reading or watching TV at the same time and not paying much attention. The same goes with radio, or with, I, with radio, where we see a lot of simultaneous activity going on. Perhaps this is driving though, so we might get better engagement. And the, cost with radio is probably much lower. 
with TV, we are seeing the average New Zealander watching one and a half to two and a half hours of television a day. We also found a report to suggest that New Zealanders on average watch 23 hours of TV a week. However, cost is a big issue with TV advertising. We know that it costs at least 2,500 to place an ad on TV. That is not to suggest the production cost. So although TV has been an effective way to communicate the health information and campaigns, it may not be a cost-effective way with a limited budget. So looking at the newer media streams and perhaps something health professionals and public health haven't tapped into to its fullest um, is a, a big potential to communicate the health information. So New Zealanders on Facebook, for instance, uh, there are 2.5 million uh, subscribers in 2014 to Facebook. 2 million people alone see, um, go onto Facebook daily. So just as an example, it is um, a cheap, easy, and effective way to produce, um, to disseminate information. And that we are seeing an increase in popularity. And the information that provided is not only in the form of text, it can be TV, um, videos, music, um, posters, and so forth. And it is dynamic. It allows us to evaluate the effectiveness of the campaign. We know how many people have liked it, how many people have shared it, how many people engage with it through comments. Um, however, we, may be, we must be cognizant of the elderly population who may not have an increase in information, um, accessibility to this type of information. So the recommendations obviously have to come from a mix. To prevent the inequality of information, we have to use more traditional streams at this stage to engage our elderly population. But I think there needs to be an increase in um, engagement or use of more um, newer medium streams, um, and in particular, providing a better phone application on daily updates on health and on air quality will allow change in behaviour. So we'll now pass over to Mike, who's going to give the conclusions for the project. Thank you, Tommy and Ali and the communications team. So based on the research and uh, study, we generally found that transport-related air pollution is considered a moderately important issue by most Wellingtonians. However, the problem is that not everybody who knows that it's a problem is acting on it. For instance, our survey found that a lot of people still use private motor vehicles as their primary means of transport. So a lot of effort needs to go into, in the future, making sure that the public is aware of uh, the issue of transport-related air pollution. And as Ali was saying, a lot of this can be done using traditional, uh, uh, modern and upcoming media forms, such as Facebook and phone applications, particularly for um, implementing that behavioral change early um, in the younger population. There also needs to be a commitment to good, strong policy from government and other institutions to make sure that we're actually tackling this issue head on. Relying solely on the general public to make individual changes is not going to be sufficient. And policy needs to be put in place to make sure that it's easy to make choices that will reduce the impact of transport-related air pollution. So to summarise what we've covered today, so we've told you that transport-related air pollution has significant and far-reaching health effects. We've told you that Wellingtonians consider it a moderately important issue that should be addressed. We've t uh, told you about our interviews with key informants, and we've told you about the five barriers that they identify with regards to action on transport-related air pollution that we need to tackle. We've told you about policies that would reduce the impact of transport-related air pollution in cities. And we've told you ways of communicating information efficiently to the general public. Air pollution might not be a leading issue at the moment in many Wellingtonians' minds, but as we've shown in this project, it probably should be. And if Wellington is to continue to lead this country forwards, it is something that we need to be taking a serious stance on. Thank you so much for listening to us. Thank you all so much for attending and any questions. <laughs>